So, last time we started with this book by Andreas Eschbach, the National Sicherheitsamt, we look in detail at the application, we will implement that in SQL and, and walk through that. And uh, in addition to that, also talk about countermeasures. Yeah? That's very important. So assume you're in a situation like that, how, how do you counter that? What can you do as a single engineer in such a company or in any company where you feel like privacy is violated uh, so dramatically? And uh, yeah, one thing we started looking at, of course, is SQL. Um, so these queries um, Andreas Eschbach mentions in his book called Strukturierte Abfragesprache, which is directly inspired by SQL, a structured query language, which was uh, started in the early 80s. And that is the language um, we looked at. So we talked about the principles. So the principles select from statement you will always be seeing. So read, reading uh, some data from the database, that's a query like that. And, um, oops. That was my pen. Back to, here we go. Yeah. So keep in mind the conceptual order of these statements. So you start with from. Yeah. Here's a list of tables. And uh, whatever those tables they are combined in a cross product, that's what I denoted here. So cross product over all of these tables. Uh, here's an example. Then comes the where, that's the second, selecting per tuple which tuples qualify and which not based on a um, Predicate, a selection predicate, that's step number two. The step number three is projecting um, whatever you uh, computed so far to a um, final result relation. Yeah? So you specify a list of attributes, the same list you would specify in this pi operator, the projection operator from relation, rela relational algebra. That's good. That's good. good place for placing a cable channel. Okay. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, we looked at that in detail. And then one final thing is where we ended up with was something like that. So that's a, a slightly larger SQL <coughs> statement. So we still have to select from where, but then you can extend that to grouping. So you first do the from, then you do the where, then you do the group by. Again, group by is three operators. You first partition it horizontally into groups based on equality. We talked about that. Um, then for each group, you compute aggregates. And then you output those aggregates. So we, we talked about these three steps in grouping. And in addition to where, we introduced having. Having is a condition to the group. So for each group uh, to be produced, you can make a decision whether that uh, should be uh, returned uh, in the result or not. Yeah? So there's a huge difference between where is per tuple that is created in from. Having is per tuple created by aggregating. Uh, aggregation creates one tuple per horizontal partition. And the conditions here are phrased against those tuples created in aggregating. Okay, that's basically the most important, important takeaways we looked at last time. Now today, um, we look a little bit at the application. Um, so I talked about Snowden global surveillance disclosures and so forth and so forth. Um, and we learned about, okay, how do we phrase more complex queries? We don't use relational algebra typically, we use SQL. We had simple examples in the, the Jupyter notebooks. And um, now we go back to transferring the basics to the con uh, concrete application. So these uh, two, ugh, come on, these two questions, uh, so what, what, what ethical problems arise from these kind of data collections? How do we deal with those? And um, next week, which is actually the week afterwards, so next week is a holiday, but then we will be looking more at the technical aspects that happens under the hood in a database system. So once you have huge data sets, one, once you have those queries, how do you get to an efficient program anyway. It's a long, long story, and we will spend two weeks on uh, scratching the surface of that a little bit. So um, that is a fatal basic idea of one of the queries in the books. So it's directly taken from the book. I think even if you read the first 42 pages, that, that is described, if I remember it correctly, so don't have to read the whole entire book, just the first 42 pages. So the idea is, on average, everyone, everybody consumes about the same amount of calories. Yeah? So you eat, eat stuff, yeah? more or less. Some eat less, some eat more. But more or less, it's, there's an average. So now if someone buys, on average, much more calories then the average, this may indicate, may, not, not an implication, but it may indicate that she or he is secretly helping someone else. In other words, hiding. So that's the idea that's done by the main character in the book and, and, and explained in detail. Huh? Showing what you can do with metadata, how you can abuse metadata. So um, to answer this query, to implement this, 
uh, what do we have to do? We first have to estimate the average calorie consumption of a person. Yeah, that's some average, some, some aggregation, it's clear. Yeah? Then we determine per household how many calories are purchased on average. We will look at that in a moment. Yeah? Then the next sim would be determine the average calorie consumption per person in that household. Yeah? You have to factor in how many people live in that household, of, of, obviously. I'll put the list in, uh, this list in ascending order, highest consumption per person first, and then see whether there are any uh, anomalies. Yeah? And in the book, this next step is carried out by the SS. Yeah? They find people, of course, yeah? but, but all this only makes the fifth step, fifth step possible, and that, that's a bad thing here. Yeah? And so for us computer scientists and data scientists, the question is really, okay, where, where does our responsibility begin and where does it end? A couple of more seats here. Yeah? And there's one, there's one, there's one. There, there, I see 10 seats. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So this is the energy relationship model. We already improved it a little bit. So wait for people to sit down. So this is the energy relationship model. Yeah, so we have households. Yeah, they, they have an ID, they have a street uh, address, basically. That we have citizens, and citizens live in households, obviously, and at all times we said, okay, they only live in one household. Yeah? So you can uh, also uh, register multiple households in Germany currently, but there's a primary address, typically, that is this household. Please really be calm. It doesn't work in this lecture hall. You, you all be calm, we, we can't do it, sorry. Okay. Um, so households, uh, and of course, in, in a household, multiple citizens can, can live in that household. Here, important, we have a start and an until date, so that's a time interval, because you can move, of course. Yeah? Um, and then to the other side of that schema, citizens may also purchase uh, articles. Yeah? And they may, you may purchase many, many articles, uh, but we will be concentrating on uh, groceries here, huh? and then look at the calories per 100 uh, grams, huh? because that's important for the calculation I, I just presented. Huh? Um, yes, that's all we need as an relationship model, and, uh, and, and keep in mind, so all the further analysis only works because we can make these links. We can link households to articles being purchased. Yeah? So the citizens um, make that, so there are these purchases link, it, link citizens to articles, and live in link citizens to households. And now we can do joints across the entire schema. And that's a problem we will be looking at in a moment. And we will also be looking at how to fix that. But first, uh, first let's talk about this time, att time attributes I used here. So when you have something like that and you want to make sure that uh, like from 2017 to 2018, Professor Dittrich lived in that apartment, then he moved to another apartment, stuff like that. So you have to have somehow time in that um, schema. So we already had that when talking about IMDb. We had role as an attribute and that became part of the key. Yeah, if you remember, uh, first lecture on energy relationship modeling. And now we have start and until. So um, that's really important because we want to make sure that we may have multiple um, uh, entries for the citizen with respect to certain uh, time intervals. So an alternative way of modeling and a natural way of modeling that is actually to have a ternary relationship type like periods of time or time intervals if you wish with the same attributes. Yeah? And then that's an N to M to one relation. Um, you could do it either way, it's fine. Now this this is, feels a little bit more like a hack but in the end you end up with the same relational model anyway so it doesn't matter, it's okay. So. Um, so when you translate that um, to, to relations, you will see that this live-in will get all these foreign keys um, like household ID, citizen ID. This is not underlined. Why not? Yeah? Because more people can live in one household. Yeah, but if you look at this, um, the reading conventions we used, yeah. These two together determine the household. Yeah? So it's enough to have as a key um, citizen ID start and until they will determine the household. So adding this to the key would be a redundancy that's not necessary because the functionality already implies that that is uh, clearly determined. Yeah, so we have, um, that's our key here. Um, 
And then, yeah, notice that this is a separate relationship, even though this is a one-to-n relationship. So when we talked about one-to-n relationships before, I told you, hey, if you have something like that, oops, if you have something like that, I mean, you just pull the attributes from the relationship type into this uh, entity type and you're good to go. Yeah? So we only used, um, for binary relationship types, we only used these um, uh, separate relations when there was an end to m relationship. But once you start uh, messing around with keys here, you have to keep it as a separate relation, otherwise it wouldn't work. Yeah? Okay, so in the translation of the second, um, yeah, the second type of modeling, so the ternary relationship type here, looks uh, is absolutely equivalent to the first. However, now you would add a separate um, relation called periods of time. Yeah, so a relation just for that, just consisting of keys, just these time intervals. Yeah, just start until. Yeah, and that's it for the attributes. Here, the, the time interval doesn't have any other attribute. Yeah. So it's a very weird situation. Typically, you have relations that where some of the attributes are the key and other attributes are not the key. But here you have a relationship, uh, relation where all the attributes are the key. Yeah, there's no non-key attribute. And yeah, then basically that's a situation um, which, which we call a domain. So basically you define the domain rather than a full-blown entity type. Yeah? So that's basically where, where you make the transition. Yeah? And uh, um, that's also the explanation for this uh, slide. Typically, when you're in a situation like that, and there's no other attribute associated to that, um, then you model it like that. However, if you now wanted to give periods of time another, another attribute that's not part of the key, you would rather model it like that. Yeah, that's exactly the transition. Yeah, but, yeah, so you see it better. When, when, you, when you model entity relationship model, models, you see it, oh yeah, is, no, is it an attribute? Is it an entity type? What is it? Yeah? And then you switch back and forth. And uh, yeah, it, it happens very often actually when modeling. Okay, <clears throat> so again, here's the, the reading exercise for ternary relationship types. We had that before, I just wrote it down again. So uh, recall it's always everybody else um, so the question is always, does everybody else except um, this entity type, well, where there's a one or any, uh, any uh, character, um, determine this entity type? So here the question is, do periods of time and citizens determine households? And this one says, yes, that is the case. Yeah? So th um, that's this first box, uh, right? Yeah. So this basically means, yeah, if you have any instance from periods of time and any instance from citizens, they determine the household. Yeah. So to, uh, given a, a specific point in time, on in the time interval, and the citizen, you know where he or she lives in which household. That's determined. Yeah? That's what that is saying. For all other uh, combinations, so we have two more combinations, of course. So the question, do citizens and households determine periods of time? No, they don't. And the other is, so that was um, this one, and do households and periods of time um, determine citizens? No, because there's an M. Yeah? That's how you read these things. However, there's a glitch in how I modeled that, and that is, well, what if start and until periods of time actually overlap? So I didn't exclude the case that the intervals that are collected here in that entity type, which will be mapped to a relationship, um, uh, not to relationship, to relation, I didn't guarantee that they do not overlap. So that would be an additional constraint you would have to add to, to uh, your database to make sure you don't run into that, uh, don't fall into that trap. Yeah? Okay, so that's the model as shown before. We, we just wrote down the stuff almost only, so it's really reduced uh, as, as, as much as possible. I think we wouldn't even need some of the things. We just kept the names here just for convenience because it looks better in the a notebook later on. And uh, what you should be, what we will do in the exercise is uh, we use some scissors and um, split this model into two models. Yes, so uh, that's basically exercise three or something like that uh, from, from the assignment we will be uploading later on. And um, so here you see, so previously it was just citizens directly connect, connected to, per, uh, to purchase articles. Yeah? And now we said, hey, no, let's assume it's two separate schemas, two separate databases, and now we introduce a new entity type, of course, yeah, which is customers. 
it has more or less the same attributes. You will know, well, here the ID is named differently, different attribute names. But in terms of semantics, maybe these things can be mapped. Yeah? And now the question is, in the exercise, you should answer, assume you have access to only this, is there a problem? The second question will be, assume you only have access to this, is there a problem? And the third question is, assume you have access to both. Is that still as problematic as, as the case from Eschbach's book? Now that's, that's the exercise you should think about a little bit. Yeah? I think it's a good, good thinking uh, exercise, actually. Yeah? That's a new thing we, we developed here. Yeah. OK, so that's the relational model um, from the book. And with that, we can go for the notebook. Okay, so we, we uh, uh, prepared some fake data here. Um, am I on the right? No, I'm on the right notebook. Uh, okay, helps to use the right notebook. Okay, so we, again, we will be using DuckDB. So that's the schema uh, the, that you have seen on the slides. We created some fake data uh, with persons, uh, with uh, fictionous uh, with persons that do not exist. Yeah, that's all made up. Uh, we used streets that don't exist in Saarbrücken. Um, yeah, and then basically that's the data. Yeah. So um, here, for instance, uh, that's a household. So we always have an ID. We have a street, postcode, and so forth and so forth, and then the floor and stuff like that. We have um, inhabitants. No, the second one is actually uh, citizens, as we call it here. First name, last name, birthday. So we dated it also back. Uh, to the um, time period as of the book, and so forth and so forth. Yeah? So all the relations we've seen in the schema. And now we can start um, developing those queries. Should I increase that a little bit more even? I don't know. Yeah, so we want to show the citizens and households that uh, they currently live in. Yeah? So we, this until attribute now uh, helps us. So in the live in, uh, we have from, now where is that? We go back. Here it is, yeah, start and until, as we modeled it. And null um, um, here means uh, the person is still living there. Yeah? So only when you move out, yeah, if you deregister from the household, you will put a date here. Yeah? That, that's the semantics of that relation. And then you can check for that. You can run um, the queries accordingly. Yeah? So if you do that, you get a list of people that um, yeah, currently live in, in those specific households. Yeah? Um, then you can um, count inhabitants. We do that using this um, shortcut I explained last time. So I really recommend you, you use uh, dynamic views. It makes li your life so much easier. The, the, the queries get uh, smaller and stuff like that. Um, and then you can do something like that. So you count per household how many inhabitants do we have in each household, just uh, displaying the ID in this case. Um, we can also show the corresponding address for each household and so plus the number of inhabitants and so forth and so forth. So those are all prep preparatory uh, steps uh, for being able to do the analysis. And now we can count the calories per household. So as, as I explained before, um, so if I go, if you look at the schema, yeah, if you look at the schema, now we are doing this join across, yeah, that, that's a problematic part that the citizens is connected to both live-in and purchase. Yeah? As we can make the connection, we can do a join. Yeah? That's where, what we're currently doing. Yeah? So we have a join um, that uh, factors in purchases, but uh, also um, the, uh, these households. So again, we define that as a view, and we get the calories per household and month. Yeah? So you have to be careful with time. Um, what do you do with time? Do you, um, how fine granular do you get in your analysis? Is it per month? Is it per week? Is it per year, quarter, and so forth and so forth? Yeah? So we did it per month. So if the calories per household, of course, um, you um, then have to be careful with the units. So, so we have to, so here we multiply it by 10 because calories in the schema, in that relation recording uh, the gross, gross, groceries you, you uh, purchased are per 100 grams. So we have to um, we, we, um, scale that up to uh, one kilograms. Um, right. What else then? Then we round a little bit. I think we don't have to go 
through all of that, you get the idea, but now we, uh, okay, now we want to have daily calories per inhabitant and household. That's the interesting analysis we're looking at. That's basically what this uh, query is doing. So that's all about, so this 183 is because um, the purchases are uh, over a period of 183 days. That's the data, how we, how we made it up. Yeah, so you have to be careful, okay, well, which ground data do you have? When did it start? When does it end? And so forth. So that's, um, so in general, this is, this is what people would call a data science task. And you always have to be very, very careful with the data. How was the data generated? Yeah, from when to, from, from when did it start being generated? When did it end? Yeah. Are there any errors in the data? It's an infinite story. Yeah? So we, we, we start with a textbook situation in a way that we believe that the data is uh, clean and correct and we don't have these problems. So. Okay, so um, then you, you have um, this kind of calculation. So you know, have daily calories, um, what we had before, and now divided by the number of inhabitants. Yeah? So 9,000 uh, calories divided by three is 3,000. That's what we see in this relation. Um, then comes the next thing. We, we um, compute the average calories. This already, already has an interesting glitch if you think about that. So I use the data where I want to find whether people hide to determine the average number of calories. What is the possible problem with that? Does anyone see that? Yeah? It could be too high because, yeah, that's more than people would normally buy. Yeah, like, like from a medical perspective, yeah, if, you, yeah, if you counted everybody in, but I don't know how many, for how many people um, these calories are used. Yeah, let's phrase it like that. So that's a glitch, yeah, simplification. Yeah, but, um, okay. Number of this, okay, I do that very. So basically, this is the total number of calories here. Um, so it's a sum over all of that, rounded up as calories. Then again, um, I have the number of inhabitants, it's 40, and then I just divide those two numbers. So that's an average, uh, 2,500. So now I can detect uh, outliers. I can read through that back home, uh, I give you the core idea. But basically, um, what you do is, uh, I want to show this query. This is not the weight result. Did I jump over something? <laughs> I'm confused. So now here we're also considering age. So that's an extension we did. Yes, we're also factoring in whether they're babies and um, I don't know. Um, yeah. So it's a little um, over engineered actually. Um, right, but that, that's the interesting thing. Now, now, now you order by daily calories per inhabitant in descending order. So that's a typical um, data analytics thing you do. Um, that you say, okay, starting with the highest amount of calories per inhabitant, yeah, that's 7,000 per inhabitant. That, that's really high. Yeah? And if you re recall, we had like 2,500 as an average. So that would be an indication. Yeah? And that could also be an indication depend on, depending on how many people um, are hidden uh, in that um, uh, in that apartment being registered here, yeah, and that's that's exactly what what the book is about, yeah. and yeah, it, it, I mean, I, f I find that really I was wasn't aware about that problem with SQL uh, that you can do with such. I mean, the the tool set we're using here is SQL 92. It's super easy stuff, yeah, and now we're tw in 23. Yeah, we're not talking data mining, machine learning, AI to do analytics. Yeah, there are actually many more things you could do with the data. Um, I'm not going to tell you about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's basically uh, this notebook. So I really invite you to, to look at that stuff, think about that, and, and be aware. Because um, yeah, the problem is um, bringing data together in huge schemas. Yeah? So this is here we're basically, basically talking, it's com two uh, semantically completely different things. So this, uh, I mean, registering people in households, what the state is doing, and then People buying stuff in, in supermarkets, which is what supermarkets will do. Yeah? You, you, yeah? One shouldn't bring these two things together. And it holds for many, many databases. You shouldn't bring a certain database together because then you will be in trouble. Okay, and that's why you should think about that in your exercises. Yeah? And um, I'm really curious on, on, how, on which ideas you will come up with. Yeah? So we have an idea, we already have a solution for this assignment sheet, actually discussed it back and forth. But uh, it's always like that, uh, 
some students come up with wide ideas on, on that break, break our assumptions. So I'm lo really looking forward to, to your solutions. Uh, maybe someone has a, has a great idea on even, in, even how to make it safer and uh, uh, protect privacy even better. Yeah? Okay, so with that, yeah, let's talk a little bit about the um, ethical problems um, that arise with these data collections. So, um, yeah, in Eschbach's book, the main character, Helene, uh, an NSA employee, uh, conceives various SQL queries and thus helps to find hidden people. Huh? And the effects uh, uh, described super well in the book, without Helene's work, many of these people wouldn't have been found. Yeah? So just she's active in identifying those people. Okay, then the aggressiveness and the killing is not done by Helene, but she's paramount in enabling this stuff. Yeah? So, I mean, it's, she is guilty, I would say, yeah, but it's a discussion for philosophers. So what does that mean for Helena's work? Yeah? So uh, Eschbach explains it uh, with various uh, of these queries, Helena, uh, yeah. Helena uh, finds her lover who is also hiding. So in the book, there's also a back and forth. Um, Helena is asked by her manager to, to do a certain analysis. She, she does the analysis and says, oh, my, my, my boyfriend, is, I identify my boyfriend who is hiding in the book. Yeah. And she is, is torn in between, you know, what, what am I going to do? do? Do I obey my boss or do I protect uh, my lover? Yeah, and that's, that's really well explained. Yeah, um, yeah and, but, but the question for us is, in this scenario, what would have prevented these people from being found? What could, have, could Helena have done? Yeah, and there, there are many things you could do, actually, in this situation. It's not, not in vain. And um, just, um, this is just for your information. Yeah? So none of the following information is to be understood as instructions for action. You do it for yourself, you adults. You make your decisions. Some of these actions are punishable by law. We will be discussing uh, the principles, uh, what are possible for, for action uh, uh, that Helena could have taken yeah? or anyone else in a similar situation. Yeah? So it's about civil disobedience, civil resistance, or like uh, in German, this is uh, proverb Sand im Getriebe, yeah? which... Uh, can change many things. So. Okay, so let's look at that. So I have six slides with just technical approaches and then there are also social approaches. So technical approach is, um, in German it's called Datensparsamkeit, which I think is a much better word than data economy in English. So it means, means when you model a database, when you come up with, with a schema, when, when, when you record data, try to collect as little data as possible. Yeah? Think about how much data is really needed to, to do these queries, to answer my task, to run the application. Yeah? So, and that's really um, paramount. Yeah? Collect as little data as possible and collect it only, and once you don't need it anymore, you, you delete it, you must delete it. It's actually um, a German uh, GDPR um, regulation uh, clearly uh, defining that. Yeah? Yeah, and one thing that's a big problem, um, one thing that's a big problem in the book is that people only pay with electronic payment transactions. Yeah? When you pay with your uh, EC or Maestro card, yeah, there will be a record in a database being collected. Yeah? And that, that, that's a core problem. If you paid cash, there wouldn't be this problem because you couldn't make the link anymore. Yeah? And uh, that's, that's a very important condition in the book. They, they banned cash. Uh, in Germany in the book and everyone is paying with these uh, cards and so you can make the links. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, yeah, in terms of modeling, uh, I would also suggest store only f a few attributes. Yeah, so for each attribute you can think about, do I really need it? Yeah, do you need that to, to application system? Um, uh, yeah, so this is basically it's the variant of the first point. Yeah, so this is uh, um, how many tuples uh, do, do, do you gonna store, and here's uh, which attributes are needed in my schema. Yeah, and one example is, for instance, we're currently developing a, a new application system, and, and then we have questions like, do I should I collect gender if someone applies for for a study program? Who cares about the gender, right? We collected that before, but I don't think why why I would need that. Um, race is the same thing, uh, or religion. Or in the US, it's, it's um, I'm not sure how the legal situation is, but I heard for certain jobs, if you apply, you mustn't send uh, a picture of yourself yeah, because who cares? I mean, it's all about your, the qualification, right? So why, why send a picture? Um, yeah, and that, that's another of some, uh, example of that. 
Yeah, so and the question then is, of course, um, can I restrict the schema at all beforehand? Um, I mean, that's what you do in modeling anyway. That's, that's the core idea of data modeling is to abstract, yeah, is to boil it down to the stuff you only need and nothing but that and, and not anything else. But once you do modeling, you feel like, oh yeah, why did I model that anyway? I mean, don't need it. Yeah? So think twice about that. And it's uh, sometimes hard to, to, to see in the beginning that some attributes may become problematic later on. Yes, as you do your modeling, you, ah, yeah, that should be fine. Why would that be a problem? But then later on, once you introduce more entity types and relationship types, you see, oh, yeah, no, that's a problem, actually. Yeah, so it's, it's difficult to make these decisions. So. Yeah, um, anonymizing data. Yeah, so um, that's one thing you could do. It doesn't fix a problem. There's a really um, important uh, um, thing where, the, where that went uh, wrong. That were, um, was when AOL, did, does any of you understand what AOL is? Ever heard about? No, right? <laughs> Two? Okay. So you must be older than everybody else. Okay. <laughs> it's like as if I said Alta Vista. Alta Vista, Alta Vista, anyone heard that? No, that's really from, from yeah, okay, Alta Vista was one of the first search engines on the web, yeah, like in the uh, early 90s, yeah, but then replaced by Google, of course. Yeah. And 20 years from now, you would say, I used Google back then. And you say, huh? what, what, what is he talking about? <laughs> okay, so AOL was a search engine. Uh, back in the 90s, and uh, they said, yeah, it's cool. I mean, let, let's support research. Let's, I mean, people enter those search terms in the search box yeah, on the search engine, and you can write a log of that. Yeah? Every search ter term ever entered in the search engine. Why not? Okay, we anonymize that, we publish it, and then research ca researchers can play with that and, and have fun and find new algorithms and stuff. Yeah, so they published it. I think it took like six or seven minutes to de-anonymize the first users, yeah? Um, and then one, one of the problems was that, um, <clears throat> so they had all the names replaced and stuff, yeah? But they didn't factor in, for instance, that many users were, were, were not Googling, AOLing for, for themselves, yeah? So it was super easy to link, not in between data sets, but they could link certain um, search terms to other search terms in the log, and by that they could de-anonymize users very quickly. Yeah. So it was a complete disaster. Yeah. And then, then, I mean, once it's published, you can't revoke it from the internet. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a bad, bad failure. And, and, and from then on, people got very, very <laughs> careful uh, releasing data sets uh, from, from uh, real systems. Yeah. Yeah, encrypting parts of the data. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. So you you, you could uh, um, encrypt an, an attribute, a tuple, a table, or the entire database. But the problem always will be that you join with an unknown plain text database, and that may possibly break the encryption. Yeah, so you, so you can construct cases where even the encrypted data, in particular, if you encrypt per tuple. Um, that's, a pass uh, that's also an issue with, with storing passwords in a database. Yeah, if you don't do it right, you can always find a database you didn't think of before that will allow you to decrypt or to, not to, to identify certain things in the data. Huh? However, all of these techniques, um, so you should, should um, all of these techniques I'm proposing, you shouldn't read as black or white or true or false. Uh, th so for all of these techniques, it's like try to um, apply as many of them as possible. Make it as difficult, as hard for an attacker, uh, attacker uh, as possible. Yeah? The more techniques you use of this stuff, there's, there's never, there's never going to be a guarantee yeah, that, that you're on the safe side, but make it as hard as possible. Um, but all of these techniques can uh, ha have their problems. Yeah? Um, yeah, then make joins difficult. Remove possible join keys. Um, so we have that uh, in, in this NSA example. Yeah? So once you go into having a uniform citizen idea, you are in trouble. That doesn't work. Yeah? That is a re huge privacy risk. And again, keep in mind, hey, you, you're fine. You're, you're, we are a democracy. Everything is good. No one would abuse that. Yeah? But you know what happens 10, 20 years from now. You never know. Yeah? The data will be there, and then we, we might be in trouble. Yeah? And um, yeah, the opposite is happening right now in Germany, unfortunately. So, so there, there are plans to introduce a burger uh, identifications number, a citizen identification number, 
in English, that's exactly how to not do it. That's exactly the opposite. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sh shouldn't do that. But there, there are other cases where it was done in the right way. And um, yeah, no one wants to uh, hear about the C word again, of course. But uh, the app that was created at the time was really great. And I would like to explain a little bit to you how that app works and why it uh, used temporary keys and that made it a super great app. In contrast to another app uh, you might have heard at the time, the Luca app, a complete disaster in terms of privacy performance and everything else. Yeah? But this was great. This was really a great project. We say, hey, that's how you should do that. Yeah? That's, a real, I think, a big inspiration on how to create those systems. Yeah. And um, right. So the Co Corona Van app. So I yeah, put some links uh, if you're interested. I think it's even open source. You can download if you want that. So it's a contract tracing app available since 2020. And you know how that works. So we all installed it in our uh, phones. I think they, they now switched it off a couple of weeks ago. Um, but basically, um, uh, you had it on your phone and you had to uh, switch on Bluetooth. And I will explain how that works in a moment. Um, it was developed by SAP and uh, Deutsche Telekom. And it was decentralized. Yeah? That, that was one, one key to, to making this... Uh, um, yeah, privacy preserving. Yeah? And initially, interesting, there was a huge discussion um, to use a centralized approach. Yeah? So there, was a, uh, there was a first proposal for, for the application and then many security people said no way, including our CISPA people, they were involved in that, said no, no, this is, this is not going to work. Yeah? And then there was a big um, discussion and criticism and then they dropped the initial proposal and went for, for this approach, this decentralized approach, which, which was really cool. Yeah? Okay, so that is the idea, simplified. Um, so you have your smartphones, they, they measure the distance to other smartphones via Bluetooth. If two smartphones fall below a distance for a period of time, so if my smartphone is uh, close to your smartphone, like within whatever, uh, three minutes, yeah, we will exchange certain keys. Nothing, no personal keys, but temporal keys. Yeah? That's, that was a key here, oops. There was a key here. There's no burger, uh, burger, uh, no citizen identification number being exchanged or stuff like that, but temporal keys that cannot be tracked back to me and you. That is the important thing here. So every smartphone generates a pseudo random key every 15 minutes. Only these are exchanged. That's also a very important aspect. It's not like once and for all I create a couple of keys. Yeah, and then I, I use these keys for years and months and whatever. No, every 50 minutes I, I have a different, different key I, w I would be exchanging with other people. Yeah? That makes, um, so the idea of that is uh, to be unable to uh, create geographic user profiles. Yeah? So being able to track where I was at certain points in time. If you, have a, if you like, uh, um, create, um, if you collect GPS data, and with each position you create, you always put the same ID. It's super easy to create a personal trace of where you were at which point in time. But if every 15 minutes is a different key, well, you need first need to make sure, okay, does that key belong to that guy or that woman or not? Yeah? I mean, if it's all on your smartphone, it's clear. Um, but if you record it from the outside yeah, and then try to find out whether this key belongs to that key, might be impossible. Yeah, and, and that's the idea here, and that's a very good idea. Yeah, so every user who tested positive reports this um, to a central server and sends his or her keys from the last two weeks to the server. So the temporal keys. So um, it's not only that you use your, so you keep a record of the temporal keys of you used on your device for the past two weeks or something like that. Yeah? Now you do a test, a corona test, PCR test, you, um, you're positive. And then uh, you can inform um, other users by just publishing the temporal keys you used in the past two weeks. Yeah? That, that's all you have to do. There's no, no information, no identification about it. It's just the keys you send them anonymously to a server, and then the server can do something with that. We will go to that um, in a moment. Yeah. Um, all users regularly download the keys of all those tested positive uh, users and intersect them locally against their own keys to determine the risk. So what does it mean? So I created those temp temporary keys. Yeah, we were in contact, contact like for three minutes. 
you um, recorded one, two, three, whatever number of temporary keys on your device. Now, one week later, I, uh, I, uh, I notify, uh, I think in the app, or I don't know, on some server, that I, um, somewhere in the app, I never did that, <laughs> in the app um, that, that I was tested positive. Then all the local keys from the past two weeks are sent to a server, including the one I exchanged with you. You regularly download all those keys that were collected on the server from people that registered positive. You download them to your device. And that's basically when you did this, um, you remember uh, checking for, for um, the dangerous contact stuff. Yeah? You remember that, you had that once uh, every day or every, every other day. And at that point in time, you intersect your local recordings of temporary and keys yeah, of people you encounter with those keys you receive from your server. Yeah, and then you can count how many keys intersect, how many keys are in that set that I receive from the server that are also my local set of people I, I, I met. Yeah? And with that you determine your risk. Yeah? We will walk through that in a moment in a, in a notebook. We, uh, I wrote a notebook where I simulated that. But that is uh, the core idea of the Corona Barn app. Yeah, with that, um, so I received a request that I should make the break even uh, shorter. Um, what? Well, the, the handies of the smartphones. Smartphones, the keys are using when it's not centralized. What do you mean unique? The unique. Uh, generated. Yeah. But that is super long. That's one. So the probability goes down like crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so security people uh, has a lot. I mean, it's, it's all about uh, making sure that keys are different. Uh, like also in hash collisions and uh, stuff. Uh, that say no how to do that. Uh, it's very long keys. So there were two important observations. So if you think about this approach, in terms of performance, it's completely nuts. Yeah. If you think about what we typically do in a database, if you did that with a central database. If you did that with a central database, you would intersect those keys in the central server, do it once and for all, and just inform the users directly who are affected. You could do that in the central system for all of Germany. That would be the most efficient way. What you're doing here is you have like 80 million, I don't know how many smartphones are out there, let's assume it's whatever, maybe 60 million, 60 million smartphones, each of them intersecting the stuff. Each of those smartphones, one of you uh, just uh, discussed with one of you uh, just in the break, downloading this data, the temporary keys of all the infected users to your smartphone, could be, I don't know, gigabytes of data, uh, if, if there are many people infected, of course. So it's completely nuts in terms of performance. Yeah? But, but that's a trade-off you're playing here. You rather pay a little bit more performance uh, than having a central approach where, where you do uh, very, very little work. Yeah? And in terms of network, keep in mind, so even if you do it once every day, once every day you build such a data set with those keys, so it's the equivalent of everyone having a smartphone watching the same video every day. It's the same bulk of data you, you have to push to those users. And of course, it's not that when I download the data um, here on my smartphone, I have to go to the original server. There's a huge caching infrastructure on our web yeah, that makes sure that Maybe I'm downloaded from a server in I mean, downtown Saarbrücken or something like that. Yeah? So the network is not overloaded. Yeah? So these problems, how to balance data and how to make sure that you not always go to the uh, server uh, was handled, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. Yeah? So there's no problem. It works. Yeah? It's in, from a computer science perspective, it's, it's kind of nuts in terms of performance, from a, but from a privacy perspective, it's great. Okay, that's what I wanted to say about that. So let's look at that um, notebook. So wrote a little notebook about that with some fake data, um, basically the idea. Um, okay, so th here's a, um, one class. Uh, the idea is uh, to have a key set, so these temporary keys I mentioned, uh, I wrapped that uh, into some class. Um, yeah, that's the central server ID um, I mentioned. So the central server I have to inform. Um, and what, that I have to, that I ask for for these positive keys uh, eventually. So I didn't did, uh, I didn't implement this with uh, having really separate threads on different servers. It all runs in one notebook. Yeah, but uh, it shows the principle. 
And then you have um, methods like that where you lock in an encounter with a specific temporal key you received on your smartphone. Yeah? And then you can print that and then you have, okay, Alice. So that's what you see on your uh, phone. You don't see that on any server. You, that's the data collected on a smartphone. So that's uh, Alice. She currently uses this key. Um, this is a track record of her own keys. As I said, the past two weeks, for instance, have to be recorded. That's, that's a medical decision in the end. And that, that, that is the encounter. So, so for each day, uh, you keep a, a set of temporal keys Alice recorded. Uh, and if you do that for each and every user <clears throat> here, for instance, a bit later, so I print that twice here. Uh, so the same user, I print it once, yeah. Then I change the day for the next encounter. Here I add another key and then you see, oh, there's a new key uh, being added and so forth and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Right, and then there's this method here. So that's basically checking the risk status, what I just explained. So at that point in time, uh, the smartphone asks the central server, give me all of these temporal keys of infected people. You get those keys, do the intersection, and then there's a risk assessment um, um, that, that informs you whether you uh, uh, have a risk of, uh, that you met, that maybe you might have corona and you should better do a test or stay back home and stuff like that. Um, so that's the kind of information here that's being displayed. And if you do that visually, um, so you can also visualize those users and make them run uh, on the screen. So here it's simulated. So it's a bunch of users that uh, track their encounters. So you see that the number on, on top of the head is the number of encounters. I think the number on the chest is the temporal key they're using. Ah, oh, it's nice, isn't it? What you can do with Shiba Tenno books. She runs again. <laughs> And you could do it with Unreal Engine, I understand, if one of you wants to do that. That's okay. Um, yeah, but then, um, so we could um, now look at the data. Again, this is not in the real application just because I have it in the data available. Yeah? So each user can only look at uh, his or her data. But then you see, okay, that's the information you record on one smartphone. So my name, whatever that is, doesn't matter. My current key, um, the keys I used on a specific date, actually only, um, I don't know, that's okay. The, the keys you used on, your, uh, on a specific date and the keys you recorded on a specific date. So it's all about uh, May 11th, it's actually today. That's fantastic, isn't it? Ah, uh, you just changed the dates to this year, actually. Okay, so we got, <laughs> okay, so we have had to go through the notebook to translate stuff to English and um, then you even changed it to today. Okay, fantastic. So that's basically the entries on the different smartphones. And again, no server is seeing all of these data together. Right? If, you, if, you, if you saw the data, uh, you could, of course, link the temporary keys, yeah? But that can't happen here because you uh, only, on each smartphone, there's the data for that smartphone. Yeah, and... Um, now you can assume that one of those persons um, uh, gets infected, makes a test, and now wants to inform everyone about, about this. So let's, we pick some random, a random person, that's this one. Um, and that's the information on that phone. And then what happens here is this person sends his or her keys to this central server. That happens in this cell. Yeah, now the server gets informed. Um, and then you, uh, that, is, that is the information the server sees. So it's, you don't have to send any ID, you just send the temporal keys. Well, that's all you need to do. And um, now every person, as said before, that uses the Corona Van app regularly downloads these IDs. Yeah? That, that happens here. And then for each person, uh, you can compute uh, the risk that person has. Yeah? So it varies depending on how uh, many interactions they had. Yeah? They say it low, medium, high, whatsoever, uh, and, and what's the force. Yeah? And then again, you could uh, even visualize that again. And I think, yeah, the red ones, yeah, they were very close to each other, at risk and one formed. Yeah? And that, that's the principle of the Corona Van app. Yeah? And uh, really, I mean, I mean, in real databases, it's sometimes hard to, um, to convert IDs to temporal IDs, but, but I just want, want to invite you to think about that. Yeah? If you're in a situation where you feel like, hey, maybe I could convert that to some, some ID principle like in the Corona Van app, go ahead, yeah? because I think it's really a great idea. Okay, um, 
Yeah, what else? Yeah, we are uh, talking about technical approaches. So um, there are a couple of more of those. So one is called differential privacy. Um, so here the idea is that you add small errors to the data so that analysis are only uh, partially uh, falsified, but still uh, you can analyze the data. So you, you um, try to make sure that you analyze the data, however, that you can't look at individual items. There, there's a bunch of techniques um, doing exactly that. Actually, our security uh, lecture teaches this stuff, so if you're interested in the details. Uh, bottom line for databases is, um, well, it, it, as far as I understand this stuff, um, this only works um, if you have the, the kind of analysis in mind already. Yeah? So if you want to uh, disallow for a certain type of analysis, it's probably a good tool. But the problem here is that well, someone comes around the corner and has a, a new idea for some sort of analysis, and then the differential privacy may not work uh, necessarily anymore. So that's so just a very powerful solution from my understanding. Yeah, change and manipulate the data. So change the data so that queries do not longer show certain results. Yeah? Yeah, like Helene in the book, she does that to avoid that uh, her boyfriend gets, uh, um, uh, gets found. Um, that's relatively easy to do. Yeah? I mean, of course, if someone looks at your, your queries, your SQL queries or whatever you're writing and detects the stuff, but uh, in real systems, it's relatively easy to hide these things. Um, yeah. and. Um, yeah, anti-hardware administration, as I call it. Um, so that's what something you can do so to mani manipulate, disrupt, or slow down the hardware. That's also used in, in the book. Um, so uh, if someone asks, hey, why didn't you produce the result yet? You say, yeah, the server was down again. I don't know what the problem is. Uh, in the book, is, there's always one, one data silo that is slow. Data silo is so uh, basically the storage medium, or what we would call a hard disk or an SSD. Um, there could be all kinds of damages, uh, workload peaks, uh, making queries slow, water damage. Um, you go to the server room and uh, spill your coffee uh, in the right place. Yeah? And yeah, these kind of things can be done yeah? in these situations. And uh, depending on how much uh, tracking is done in, in, in that uh, company or institution, uh, they, yeah, there are many things you could do along those lines, actually. Yeah, and particularly if you have to do with managers who don't understand what you're doing. Yeah. So if, uh, if, you have to, if you deal with people who really understand what you're doing and say, oh, well, why are you doing that? It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, yeah, but this is a long story, actually. Yeah, yeah then uh, the, the, the biggest uh, lever you have is anti, what I call anti-software engineering. So, so you manipulate, disrupt, or slow down the software. Yeah, so if the query takes so long, you say, okay, there's nothing we can do about it. It simply takes that long. SQL is slow, right? It must be slow. It's always like that. Professor Dietrich told me that. I mean, a very prominent uh, thing people do is they produce unmaintainable spaghetti code. Yeah? So most of us um, do that anyway. <laughs> I hope you, after completing your studies, you don't. Uh, I mean, we've all seen that stuff, right? And, and, and then the older a project gets, uh, the more spaghetti uh, is being produced, typically. And uh, yeah, then it gets hard to track down things, track what the system is doing, debugging these things. Yeah, and you can hide many, many, many things in the system uh, if it's not well documented. Um, yeah, that will that will be something. Yeah. Include hard to find errors. Yeah? Here, concurrency is really your friend. Yeah? You, you learn about um, how difficult it is to find concurrency bugs. Yeah? But if you want to introduce bugs, yeah, that's really, I mean, the crea unlimited creativity can be used here to, <laughs> to really bring down the system and no one finds the stuff. Yeah? They're relatively easy. Yeah? Write complex queries that overwhelm the query optimizer. So when we go back to database systems, and I will tell you about in the next uh, two uh, lecture slots about what the query optimizer actually does, yeah? I will also give you hints on um, yeah, how, you, how you ruin the query performance in any system. Uh, it's, uh, depending on the system, there are many things you can do. Um, also, when we look at the different types of database systems, so the systems that store the data and execute uh, SQL, we will have a more precise definition of the, what the system is later on. But there are so many systems. Like, uh, there are currently like 850 different database systems on this planet. And uh, they have very, very different capabilities. Yeah? And if you are in a uh, situation X and you use a system that's not right for, for situation X, 
you're doomed. So the database system will ruin everything. Um, you can configure the database system incorrectly. Very, very easy to do. You could uh, go for NoSQL, even though uh, the relational system would be better. You could use JSON wherever you can or XML wherever you can. That will slow down things dramatically, make your life hard. Um, yeah, a very prominent thing that, that actually happens very quickly is um, write code that has quadratic or worse runtime. Yeah, as, as you see that um, very often, you write, for instance, if you write a loop that's calling um, a function, and in that function, there's again a loop depending on that same parameter you're using outside. Yeah, assume you write, I don't know, can we do it? Um, maybe it's opportunity to, um, where is this? Ah, it's a different um, iPad. No, so I'm scribbling on the, okay, I can scribble it here. Um, here, here, okay, you see that? Okay, so you have a loop like that, yeah, for E, uh, whatever, from one to, uh, one to N, to N, yeah, and then you do foo of N, yeah, and that is your, um, and that is your function, it doesn't matter, yeah? but, but there's a different function, foo here, takes this n as a parameter, for instance, and there's another loop being run for i, whatever, from one to n, blah, 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 yeah? So this is square complexity because yeah, whenever t when every time inside the loop you call foo, again, you execute a loop running from one to n again. And so overall it's n times n, it's square complexity. And that's sometimes hard to see in code um, because you look at the single function and then you ignore what, what, um, what this function is doing even though it's as a, as a, as a parameter, this is n again. Yeah? So that's really a problem. And, um, okay, where was I? Um, Technical approaches. Yeah, here, yeah. I mean, in the context of, um, of database systems, we learned that, hey, we, we use these join um, operators, huh? a join algorithm. And I told you, hey, join algorithm is just synty syntactic sugar to have a cross product and afterwards you filter it. As a cross product has square complexity. If you really create this cross product, so it's two loop, it's a nested loop, and then you filter out the tuples, there will be quadratic complexity. But of course, a database system doesn't do it like that. Yeah? So we look at that a little bit and see, no, no, the join algorithms typically run in linear time or n log n time. Yeah, that's the typical complexity, and that's why it joins uh, uh, lightning fast. Yeah? But if you change the system to never use these joins and just do quadratic complexity, yeah, you can bring it down very easily. It will work for small input data sets, but not for bigger anymore. Yeah, they're not documenting the code. Um, that, that's also a great idea to make a system uh, unmaintainable or uh, document it incorrectly. That's even, even better. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, yesterday I talked to, to, uh, talk to one of my PhD students. Um, um, how much can I ask? It's, um, let's phrase it like that. So sometimes um, uh, there, there's a situation that a company is using a system. And there are developers who uh, develop that system. Oh, there's someone sitting there. I never saw you. Hey, hi. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, so, so sometimes developers develop a system, say an open source system. And then companies use that system. Yeah. And then eventually um, companies have trouble understanding what the heck is going on in that system. And then they identify the people that uh, developed the system in the first place and ask them, hey, could you please help me? It's only three people on the planet who seem to understand the code. Yeah, and then, then, then these developers say, no, no, I'm not interested, right? I mean, what, what are you gonna offer me? Yeah, I offer you like uh, 200,000 euros. No, come on, I'm not gonna work for that, right? I mean, I mean go, go away, right, yeah? And you, you understand in which situation you are, yeah? So that's a situation where it would be absolutely stupid to document your system well. Yeah, because if that was the case, yeah, they wouldn't give you the big paycheck. Yeah? 
I've seen that in action, believe me, <laughs> as a developer in the company. It's, uh, it, I mean, you can obfuscate variable names and don't make document. It's the same, like, it's basically, again, anti-software engineering. Yeah, that, 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 that's also helping you to, to have a big paycheck engineering. Yeah, and a good software engineering is, is, is a smaller paycheck engineering. Yeah, that, that's a trade-off you have to play <laughs> kind of in, in getting a job. Yeah. Yeah, um, okay. So yeah, with that, let's uh, turn to the social approaches. So, so if someone asks you why, why things are, are not progressing uh, as they want uh, things to progress, and we say this query is more complicated than I thought, I need more time, yeah? Yeah, so if, your manager approach, if the manager approaches Helene, she says that, oh, I don't know how that works. She knows it directly how it works, but she still hasn't, um, found a countermeasure. Huh? It's not that simple. We should still consider aspect X, Y. So keep on discussing. Let's do, let's do some more useless meetings to, 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 to uh, postpone that. Huh? Yeah, th that's also a, a nice one. Huh? So we don't have the right software hardware for it. We first have to buy X, Y, Z and organize training, deploy X, Y, and then we can do this kind of analysis. Huh? So in the context of databases, you could claim, oh, my relational system can't do that. Of course it can. Um, we first have to use a different system, like NoSQL, it doesn't make any sense. Anyway, let's go for it, yeah, so and then it takes time. Or oh, that's also, this is a cool one. It's a bit mean to Mr. X, but th this is how you could do this. For, for this, we should call in Mr. X. He's an expert in the field, yeah? The truth, Mr. X is an idiot and will mostly slow, slow down the project. You know that. You will know that from projects. Certain people in the project, they bring it down, no matter how brilliant people you have in the project. Um, yeah. <laughs> and if you are in a situation escalated earlier, yeah, the same for, for the learning groups for this lecture, if you feel like one is not contributing, it doesn't have to be an idiot, yeah, but if it's not, he or she is not contributing, really escalated early to us. Yeah, yeah we should delegate this, this to department Y. We didn't get anything right in the past either, so. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the project is too big, we should divide it into sub-projects, so, so afterwards no one has an overview and we lose time in pointless meetings. Yeah? So if you split it into the right pieces and make sure there's no one who has a big picture and coordinates uh, sub-projects in the right way, you, you're screwed as well. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, Legal approaches, and that's the most important thing, really, is prevent joints. Yeah, that's, again, that's a counter idea to uh, a citizen identification number. Yeah? Make access to multiple data sources difficult, um, no data cartels. Yeah? I mean, the very idea of big data analytics, the name of my group, or the, the, the name of this lecture is to bring different data sets together. And that's exactly what you should not do yeah, to, to event these to prevent these things. Yeah? So should we change the naming? Not doing big data analytics group, or whatever. Yeah? But uh, th that's a risk you have to be aware of. Yeah, yeah. so you should, we should strongly re restrict access to sensitive data sources. Um, yeah, we should prevent certain types of data sources from being brought together. Yeah? So I don't hear much about this being bringing data sources together. Yeah? So people talk about, hey, we do these kind of analytics and big data. I don't care about big, it's small data sets. That's a problem already. Um, yeah, so it's a very difficult decision. Yeah, um, right. So what are sensitive data sources? Yeah? As alluded to before, it's not easy to decide. Yeah? So is temporal data sensitive? Very likely. Temporal data is always like, oh, be, be careful. Yeah? Because I mean, geographic positions, for instance, we had that in who lives where at which point in time, ah, that's, it's very difficult. So temporal data is typically a great joint key. Yeah? If you have one data set with temporal information and another data set with temporal information, join over te uh, the temporal data, boom. Yeah? Not good. Yeah? Is spatial data sensitive? Very likely. Uh, did you hear about the case about the US Army um, bases? There was a case where people were jogging, uh, running, had their smartphone uh, tracker app on, yeah, and that data was sent to a server, and by that data you could identify hidden U.S. Army bases. Ouch. Yeah, yeah and so it's, it's super sensitive data. And for other data, uh, what about other data? If you have data that's not neither temporal nor spatial, is that a problem? Well, it depends. It's, it's very hard to say, really. Yeah. Um, did we go into that? So how many slides are left here anyway? Um, Um, 
you now a little bit. <coughs> okay, let me show that a little bit. So this is another thing we made up. Um, so also, um, so if you think about, okay, you can abuse the data, you can also use that for good uh, in a way. Huh? So and, um, here's something where you might also um, use that for good. So, so, so the idea is here, so a crime was committed um, at that point in time, and, and the witness observed someone from, for whom a, a sketch was made. Huh? Uh, so sort of a phantom picture, or, or, or a picture from a surveillance camera or whatever. Huh? Um, um, and, that might, and then the police says, okay, that might be Mr. M. That he might be a, a, possible, a possible suspect. Um, Mr. M is registered in April. Oh, so in X, so X, X is location, I'm getting it, okay. So that's the location, X, yeah, whatever, Saarbrücken, downtown. Yeah. Fitness observed it, sketch was made, phantom picture. And uh, now Mr. M was registered, could be that, that a smartphone, uh, smartphone was registered in that uh, phone cell or something like that, this uh, mobile phone um, sending cell. Um, yeah, and, and, and uh, so, so um, here you can think about, okay, what data is available to, to either uh, make sh uh, <clears throat> prove that Mr. M um, is a possible suspect or to, uh, to, uh, to acquit in, in the sense, say, now it's guaranteed that he can't be a suspect. He was in a different place. Yeah? So how could you use data in that um, situation? So, so it could be that the GPS data from his um, now intercepted mobile phone says, no. Yeah? So it might be that the police seizes um, his uh, smartphone says, no, no, the GPS track he, I have here doesn't make any sense. I mean, it could have been manipulated. Yeah? Maybe it manipulates the data um, beforehand um, to trick the police into believing that he wasn't there. Huh? It could be stuff like that, that, that his voice was recorded by another mobile phone. Uh, this mobile phone was located 200 kilometers away from the city. So that's way more involved. Yes? It would have, would, have, would have to have access to that mobile phone or even to the network architecture surveying people. Huh? As I told you before, in the context of the, um, the Snowden uh, revelations, uh, the, the, the where, um, yeah, he, he revealed that uh, all these phone calls are being recorded. I don't think that police has access to that. But, but maybe, incidentally, police monitored the phone and then they, they recorded uh, uh, his voice and then uh, through speech recognition they can, yeah, oh yeah, the guy was 200 kilometers away. Yeah, so that, that would be a strong indication. Huh? Then they have stuff like that, electricity and water meters of M's flat and X clearly show that someone was at, at his home in the morning until 10 a.m. and in, in the evening from 6 p.m. Yeah? Was it him? Was it, was it cleaning personnel? Or, or was it a girlfriend uh, or the dog? I don't know, but, but there's indication that someone was in the flat using electricity and water. Uh, so was it M? Eh? So this is like, um, because it's like a, a big uh, a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah? You have these small pieces and you try to understand, I mean, like in every uh, criminal movie, yeah, this, uh, okay, there's this, doesn't fit to this one, oh yeah, but that makes sense. You try to um, bring the pieces together to form a picture. That maybe it's not a, a proof in a mathematical sense, but it gives you a lot of indication and um, whether certain, how, how things uh, actually happened. Um, yeah, I think I want to skip over that. If you, if you want, you can look at the notebook. Um, so we play a little bit with the data. Um, right. Okay, so to wrap up. Uh, so we looked at this question too. What are the ethical problems that arise from these kind of data collections? How do we deal with them? So there are many countermeasures, both legal and civil disobedience are possible here. The, um, this joint evaluation don't don't get that wrong. I'm not so sure whether the spelling is. I think that's the spelling is. Yeah, don't joint evaluation. You know what I mean, right? Of several data sources should be much more strongly regulated. Um, this monitoring through metadata, which is also often processed uh, video or audio data. Yes, yeah? so you can. It's obvious that you don't store all of the audio files, but you extract the text, just store the text. Mm, that may, might be enough for your analysis. The same as video. Maybe it's enough to just record the persons you identified and not the entire video. So the metadata. So we were talking about metadata only, not the fancy computer vision stuff. That is already a problem. That's a big problem in, in many uh, situations. So, and these effects, and that, that's, that's, there's a positive twist to that, they can be used for bad. Yeah, see the examples above. 
but also used for good. Um, one thing we will be touching briefly later on is called data journalism. So journal journalists that get access to huge um, data sets, yeah, for instance, about tax evasion and stuff like that. There, there are multiple of these leaks in the past. Uh, we will also talk in the lecture why these leaks happen in the first place, what the technical problem with databases is. Um, that's another story. Yeah, but, but they could use data for good. Yeah? If you believe that finding people who do tax evasion is good, I believe that's a good thing. Um, yeah, then that's a good thing. So an acquittal by data, meaning yeah, that you really um, can prove that someone cannot be a suspect, that they didn't commit a crime. That's also how you could use data for good. And the problem is uh, the, the possible abuse of, of these data sets. Yeah, the underlying principle problem is very difficult to solve. So what if data gets into the wrong hands? Yeah, that's, that's always, the data is there and that's the problem. Data shouldn't be there. Yes, try deleting data as early as possible. Only collect the stuff you're interested in and be, be careful. Yeah, so outlook for in two weeks is query optimization. Next week, no lecture. So what if data gets bigger? How do we actually get from SQL to an efficient program? A couple of more hints for reading. So already um, uh, showed you some. Um, Edward Snowden wrote uh, biography, which is really great. I invite you uh, to read that. R really easy read. It explains the entire story and how, how he got to uh, where he got. Glenn Greenwald uh, is the journalist um, that received uh, the data from Edward Snowden. So Edward Snowden, uh, Edward Snowden uh, stole a large collection of data from NSA and gave it to Green, Glenn Greenwald, who then unveiled it every, every couple of days was a new uh, uh, thing he revealed. Um, if you believe that this is a new phenomenon, I have to disappoint you. So for Germany, there's an interesting book for, by Josef Poschepoth. He was or still is a professor of history in Freiburg. He um, explains in his book uh, how much um, monitoring of uh, um, uh, normal uh, mail happened and how the phones were, were um, uh, monitored in, in, in Western Germany uh, before the unification. That's an interesting book. And even earlier than that, uh, Tom Hillenbrand um, did a talk where he uh, explained how, how even in, in 1684, um, the, the mail was systematically um, screened uh, at the time. There were, they, they had uh, offices where they would open the, the wax seals of mails, read it, translate it if necessary, and um, close it again with the right seal. They had large collections of seals from all over Europe and made sure that uh, the, the recipient wouldn't, wouldn't notice. Um, yeah, that's it for today. Bit early. Anyway, thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.